Okay, good morning and thank you for coming and thank you to Univers Universitas Gunadama for hosting this seminar. Uh, Cisco has talked a lot about the Wikimedia community from the Indonesian perspective and looking at the content contributors, the open content that most readers of the internet have seen at some point, Wikipedia. It's the main visible product of the Wikimedia organisation. However, underneath the Wikimedia products that people see on an everyday basis is a lot of open source software. So Wikimedia is one of the Google Summer of Code uh, organisations. We provide in the order of 10 to 15 projects to Google to fund. Google funds them because they know that the ecosystem of open source helps them make money. Good quality software on the internet allows them to make their money. If the internet is full of rubbish, no one uses browsers anymore. Some other technology will take over. They want to be at the top of the game and the way to do that is to fund the best projects. Wikimedia is of course one of the biggest websites in the world and so they want to be directly involved in that. Most Wikipedia users will only ever see this little box here, the skin, the user interface of the MediaWiki software. This is JavaScript, jQuery, it is a little bit of PHP, but then as we go down the stack we get into more and more uh, technology that is um, uh, higher end, more complex, down into very large scale internet uh, distribution of content with proxies, um, with uh, uh, HTTP rules to ensure that the uh, material ends up across the internet as quickly as possible, caching rules. We also have apps to try and distribute the content to people in different formats. And then over in the far corner here we have bots. A bot is a computer program generally that is interacting with humans in some way. That's generally what the uh, concept is about. So you'll see them on chat services, automatically answering people's questions, and they're also on Wikipedia. They do answer questions. If you have questions, you can ask a bot. But more importantly, they do small, menial little tasks, like fixing spelling mistakes. We have bot frameworks in nearly every programming language. Python, Haskell, C, JavaScript, etc, etc. Now the projects that I put up in the Wikimedia organisation are in the Python language for this little box here. The Python Wikipedia library essentially. On English Wikipedia, 50% of all edits are done by a bot. They're not done by humans. 50%. On Indonesian Wikipedia, we're looking at 5 to 10%. And this is one of the largest differences of why Indonesian Wikipedia is small and slow. Now granted, a lot of it is to do with some of the cultural issues. However, as an example, on English Wikipedia, something that most people do not realise is that a lot of the content came from the 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica. The content was imported into English Wikipedia by a bot. Articles about all of the various uh, species in the world are all imported into English Wikipedia by a bot creating the articles and then also fixing them, improving them, growing the articles with new information. Not every article needs to be written by a human, at least to begin with. Of course there's richness that can be added by human writing prose, but you can also end up with a high quality information coming from out of a database, translated into prose and viewed by many people. So that is what this box here is all about, is actually the largest component of the activity on Wikipedia here, and it's in every language. 
When we did a presentation in a uh, seminar in Samarinda, we had one gentleman who's doing psychology, uh, and he will be participating in Basuk Code. Uh, he's one of the first registra registrations from Samarinda. Um, he does open science. This is the world that we are coming into now, where all types of fields of information are all being done online in shared environments like GitHub, which we'll talk about uh, later. So that it is very common for people outside of information science to be very familiar with information science technologies. Okay, I'll be very quickly looking at the Pursuit Code program, Google Summer of Code program, and then how to build your GitHub profile. Before running Pursuit Code Universitas, we did a program for SMA um, school children, high school children, actually starting from age 13. It's not quite SMA, and we have one uh, girl who is actually 13 in the program, and that's just winding up now. One of the best, uh, it's always hard to evaluate um, school children, especially in a small program like this, but one of the best participants is actually a 15 year old, and I'll have to ask again. Dari Kebumen, dia gak bisa bilang Kebumen. In Australia, we would call that the outback, uh, the middle of nowhere, <laughs> um, and it's similar here. Uh, he has previously been mostly a blogger. He would blog about cool technology that he's seen and he's played with, but mostly what he was doing was blogging. Upon joining the program, he was challenged to start writing real code in real projects with real technology. And over the course of the first two months, uh, he rose to that challenge. Um, and then when we did the launch of Basuk Code Universitas in Malang, uh, we brought him there and uh, gave him a, a laptop. And we've also given him Pulsar, I think twice, uh, once or twice, to keep him going um, so he can continue to explore his curiosity and where it takes him uh, to learn as much as possible. The reason I raise this here is that we have a lot of people registering for Basuk Code Universitas. It seems that there are a lot of IT students in Indonesia who are very good at filling in a Google form. However, we have a few extra steps in Pursuit Code Universitas and SMA registration. You must actually demonstrate ability to use multiple online services, and we'll look at that in a minute. So if you're thinking, can I do this, should I do this? We have 15-year-old kids essentially doing this and excelling at it. We have psychology students in Samarinda doing it. If you can't do it, you might be looking at the wrong career path because there are other people who can do it who are younger than you or who are doing something else as their specialty and even they can do it. Okay, so keep that in mind. If you want to do IT and you can't do everything that I'm presenting here today, you may need to rethink your career because this is what's going to be required in the future for you. Very quickly, the program has this registration period. We have lots of happy faces. Some of those people have fa happy faces because they've done a Google form. They think they've done it. They forget, or well, they don't read the links that we provide them to tell them there are some extra steps. Other people go through the extra steps, find it a little bit challenging, but Generally, it's a computer system, they, are, they can understand, they do the steps, they walk away happy. At the end of the registration period, there are a lot of very sad faces. Throughout the elimination period, there are a lot of sad faces. And then we do some mentoring. Finally, we hope to uh, produce a few very good uh, candidates for the, uh, for the Google Summer of Code program. We'll help you get into the Google Summer of Code program if you've demonstrated that you are good and that you are interested and you're curious and you're serious. The registration process involves a few online services 
that most of you should have already interacted with in the past. If not, this is an opportunity for you to, to learn them. We have GitHub, Wikimedia, Stack Overflow, and one that you may not be familiar with is Project Eula, which is uh, freely produced open content math problems. And online there are many people who have already solved these math problems already. They provide their code. They are very good problems though. And the way that we've been testing the SMA school kids is we put them in a room without the internet, with just their laptop, and we sort of closely monitor them. So many of them say, I can solve this problem because they copied and pasted, and that's fine. But did they learn? Can they do it again without the internet? Did they actually learn how to solve that type of problem? That's what Project Euler is. After setting up your accounts, we then require that you have used those accounts with very basic level of competency. Creating a Jekyll website might sound scary, but in our module, we show you how you can do it in maybe five clicks. Okay, it's really simple. The intent is to get you started, not to actually build a beautiful website, but to show you how easy it is. Edit a Wikipedia article, and in this case, a one word edit is okay. Actually, a one word edit is preferable. If it's your first edit to um, Indonesian Wikipedia, search for Damana without a space and then add a space. Okay, improving the quality of the Bahasa in the article. Very simple. Earn one Stack Overflow badge, which uh, is as simple as reading some help pages. Uh, solve three Project Eula problems. And again, the code is on the internet. You don't have to learn how to solve the problem by yourself. And we're not expecting you to. This is actually could be re rewritten, can you copy and paste and run a bit of Python or a bit of C code? Okay, it's testing competency. And then fix a small bug in a GitHub repository. So familiarizing yourself with GitHub and how to interact with it. Then in the elimination period, we have five tasks of increasing difficulty. So even if you don't think you're going to make it through this elimination process, I encourage you to get started, to try these problems. Find how far you can go. If you spend a little bit of time on these, you should be able to solve all of them. Okay, here we have a sample task. This would be on the easy end of the spectrum, which is to translate 20 messages from English into Bahasa, but it is fairly simple if you actually read the documentation for this language. The last task, if we just go back, if, we, if you make it down to the bottom here, you'll be doing the types of tasks that are required if you're applying to do a Google Summer of Code project. When I, as a mentor, review a set of applications for Google Summer of Code, I'll be looking to see whether you can solve this type of problem. So you can think of this, of Basuit code, as a way to see how ready you are for a program like Google Summer of Code. And I hope that most of you make, make it all the way through. However, to make it a bit more of a competition and a bit more exciting, every third day we will review your contributions to GitHub and check that you have been active on GitHub. So this is to ensure you are throughout that entire month growing your own experience base on GitHub. So that by the end of that month, you have tried new things, you've done, looked at new projects, you've remained active throughout that period. The tasks, the five tasks, will all be on GitHub. So the, sorry, not all the tasks, most of the tasks are on GitHub. So those tasks will already give you some activity. But the intent here is to make sure that you're always active. Every three days, you must have done at least one thing on GitHub.
and then on the 20th at the end of the elimination period you must have three Stack Overflow badges. For the people who already have Stack Overflow accounts, do you have three badges already? Yeah. Tiga? Badge? Blum. Okay. So we already have one participant here who has achieved that goal. And we don't require you've got three new ones, we just require that you've got three. Again, we're looking at basic competency. All of those tasks will also be in Bahasa. Um, they will not be written by me. <laughs> They'll be uh, translated by Siska and the Wikimedia Indonesia team. Um, the objective is not whether you uh, can read English very well. Um, while that will be important, um, the suit code is an entry program. It is intended to allow you to step up your skills or at least evaluate how good your current skills are. If you make it through the elimination, you'll be then given mentoring by myself and also our team of uh, previous Google Summer of Code um, participants, people who've done this before, people who can guide you in perfecting your style, the way that you code, the things that you're not seeing that are important, specifically because in Google Summer of Code you'll be doing open source contributions. So during this mentoring period we'll all be working on a very common problem that needs a solution and there are lots of different components to that problem and each person will have their own component given to them. You'll be able to choose what programming language you want to work in, any programming language at all. So if you are practicing a new language and you want to learn more about that language, uh, that's okay. You can use that language so long as you're competent in that language, basic competency, that's okay. You'll then be able to add a block, a piece of our puzzle that we have this new problem that needs to be solved. To finish the mentoring process, your code that you build will be merged into it a online GitHub repository. It will be real code solving a real problem and it's the first time that problem has been solved. So this is not like a university project where you are asked to build an Android app exactly the same as everyone else's Android app and then your university lecturer and the, um, their assistants pick which ones are the best and try and evaluate how well you wrote the application and then into the bin. Now this goes on to GitHub and this will be used by people around the world to advance civilization, essentially. Okay, after the mentoring, we will pick five orang orang people, bring them to Jakarta and give them personalized mentoring specifically to help them write their Google Summer of Code application. Formulate the project, they might have an idea already, we'll help them get ideas if they don't have them but write up their description so that it is a well-formed project ready for someone like myself as a mentor to review and accept. We won't be writing it for you, but we'll be making sure that you write a good application. Of the five people that uh, are in the uh, specialised session in Jakarta, uh, where you'll be able to uh, interact with hopefully the five best coders of your age bracket in uh, Indonesia, um, Two of those will go to Singapore to network with other uh, very competent programmers um, from the Asia region. Um, FOSS Asia also has a lot of um, international people coming as well. Predominantly it's Asians, but then there's a lot of especially European uh, speakers and uh, participants uh, who come to that. And we'll also be interning uh, two of the Basuk Code um, finalists of that period. So all of this is about interning people for Wikimedia Indonesia as well. So looking at the process a little bit once you actually get to Google Summer of Code. Uh, now while we will be assisting a small group, you're able to do it yourself. Many people have before. We have uh, a long history of at least one person from Indonesia making it themselves without any assistance. Okay, so this is still relevant even if you don't make it through the Pursuit Code program and you still want to apply, by all means, do apply. 
I will receive in the order of 20 to 30 applications ranging from a blank sheet of paper with someone's name on it saying they would like to be mentored without saying what they want to be mentored in or how or why, what they've already done, what they should do in the future. They're just a blank sheet of paper through to very well formed projects where they know what they want to achieve, which language they want to do it in, and they've done their research to know it hasn't been done before. Okay, so I'm sitting here reviewing all these applications. If I approve it, Google funds it. Doesn't hurt me. So I tend to be lenient and accepting. If you think you can do it, you describe a project and it sounds like you can do it, I'm happy to mentor you. Google does the funding of your time. Um, I don't get funded at all. Um, and I can stop after a month and a half if you've turned out to not be competent. Um, so there's a, um, a, a midpoint at which I can say this is not working. I've had a few of those applications where someone is very good at writing an application. They're not so good at coding. In which case they convince me that they can actually write the program that they say they want to uh, do. I accept them, find out later on they can't code. I also have applications where I can see the person is competent, technically quite good, know what they want to do, but have very poor English. And I still accept them. They seem to know what they're doing and I've regularly been surprised. They can do it, um, even if they're from India and don't know English or from China or wherever they're from. Um, we're not, or these programs are not about language skills in human communication, but programming skills. So I've had people who've actually finished the project within one of the three months without any communication between me and them. The mentoring didn't really happen. They already knew what to do. They knew how to find out all the problems and solve them all without really involving me at all. I only had to say, yes, do this, don't do this, at the very beginning and after that point. Off they went, finished the project after one month and then for two months, we essentially have to tread water, have to think of things to do. Uh, and that's where it got difficult because we weren't able to communicate very well. Um, but uh, if you can code um, and you don't have good English, don't let that uh, scare you away from a program like this. I've got a list of potential questions you might want to fill in when you're doing an application. Common sorts of things you'll be putting into any application, whether it's a scholarship application for a university, a job application, these are the types of things that people often are interested in. I don't care what you tell me basically, you can give me a blank piece of paper almost. I will get your name, I will put it into Google search and I will search and that's all I will read basically or at least that's the first thing I will read. I might come back to your application after I've done this but if I want to see if you can program I don't want to read what you've actually what you tell me you can do but what you actually have done you should have some internet presence. You should have published some code. Even if it's not high quality, it's whether or not you've tried, whether you've started to put your code out there, whether you've participated in open source projects, even if it's just raising a bug, describing a problem with existing code. If you're not interacting with other people about software, then I'm not particularly interested in being the first person you've talked to on the international level about code. I want to make sure you've already been immersing yourself in a community talking about code, talking about tools, talking about operating systems. And if you've been doing that and doing that online, you'll have an online presence. And that's what I'll be looking at. Specifically, most importantly, your GitHub account. More than anything else, that's what I'm looking at. There is another service called Open Hub, which is slightly broader than GitHub. It doesn't host the repositories. It just uh, reports, does analytics on repositories hosted anywhere, including GitHub. So it's a broader collection 
but it's less information. It's only the metadata. But I'm also interested in, have you been discussing on Stack Overflow or the other Stack Exchange websites? Have you been writing about software development? Can you describe the concepts that you're learning throughout your university life? Have you been contributing to other types of online services like OpenStreetMap? If you haven't been doing this, you're not ready for the real world because you don't know, intimately know, spatial data. And in today's world, especially with mobile phones, nearly every piece of software that's written requires some sort of, where is it on a map? feature, in which case you need geospatial data. How good are you at geospatial data? So these other types of websites are also very important. Anything that you've done online that's contributing is also learning. While you may see it as only giving away your time, it's evidence of what you have learnt. And that's what I'm looking for. Who here knows what Git is? Hands up. Git software. Satu, Tua. Tiga. Do we have Umpat? <laughs> ah, the cameraman always puts up his hands for these questions. In this case, yes, the cameraman does know Git. And that highlights the point. Our cameraman here knows what Git is. Why don't you? As an information technology specialist of some sort, you should be using Git on an almost daily basis. If you're not, again, I challenge you to consider, is this really the right career path for you? Because in the real world, people are using Git on a daily basis. A very, very quick overview, which I will mostly skip as there is Bahasa on the slides that you can read. It is a version controlled system that is essentially file sharing with versions distributed across the internet so that everybody can interact on a set of files at different points in time they can do it offline, for example. A person in Kubuman? <laughs> oh, no, this is Kadiri, but that's Kubuman, wasn't it? Can also interact with his repository offline and then merge when he comes back online. And we also have someone in Kadiri who is uh, an hour away from internet. Uh, so he generally does all of his work completely offline which as you'll be familiar with now, being online is almost critical for being a software developer. Even if it's only looking up help, you know, what was this function called? When I was doing programming in university, there essentially was no internet for that type of thing. We had to carry around books. You know, here is my Java manual, my Perl manual, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but nowadays we just Google it. We want the answers that way. Um, for 16, uh, 17 year old in Kadiri, he can't do that. He has to download things and keep a copy or have real books. Uh, Git is a way of achieving that sort of interact interactivity remote across time and space. Okay. Down the bottom here we have three links that are manuals and tutorials in Bahasa for Git. Um, I strongly recommend that you read them all thoroughly, carefully, practice it daily. You will be using this. In 10 years time, the shop owner selling food, the warung, uh, warung lady, will be using Git. She may not know that she's using Git, but the information management 
process that she'll be using will be a piece of software that is sitting on top of a Git repository. Okay, so if you want to be information technology specialists, hopefully you know the tool and understand the tool that she is using so that you can go in and help her debug her information if there's a problem with the Git repository, for example. Now the next section we'll be talking about GitHub, which is an online service that acts as the remote over in the side here. It is the place that the sharing occurs. It is where you put your code or your documents, your files, so that other people can download them. It is the uh, common ground. It is the central component that we all use. Okay. Uh, GitHub has 35 million repositories and the number is growing rapidly every day. There's 125,000 lines of code being added to GitHub on a daily basis. And 14 million users. Which is starting to get among some of the large websites. The growth of GitHub over the last three months we can see here it went from the 62nd largest website three months ago to being the 53rd largest website in three months. And this site is a highly technical website. It's not Facebook. It's essentially the Facebook for IT people at the moment. That's the best way of describing it. Just a quick look at uh, GitHub in perspective of other websites. Some of these sites you may be familiar with. Hopefully this gives you some idea of where it sits in the size of websites. It is huge. It has many users using it on, on a daily basis. Here is part of my profile on GitHub. On the Side here we can see contributions that are being made to various projects. All open, all public, all available for anyone to browse on a regular basis. At the, <clears throat> at the top here we have my time card. I don't go into the office of Wikimedia Indonesia every day. Um, all of you are familiar with the traffic problems of Jakarta. Um, I prefer to stay at home and I expect most of you will also look for careers where you can stay at home as much as possible or at least not have to go into the city. Um, it's not fun. So this is my time card. Every day I clock in on GitHub. At some point during the day I make a contribution to a project, I commit some code, I raise a bug, I do something. This is how my boss knows that I work. This level of activity is what Pursuit Code will give to you. During the one month of the uh, elimination period, you will have a profile that looks roughly like this. Regular activity, at least every three days, you'll end up with a green dot as opposed to uh, a grey dot, uh, an empty box there. Okay, so this is every day whether I did something or I didn't and you can have the exact same because this is what I as a mentor will be looking for when I'm reviewing your application. So if you want to maximise your chances of being accepted into a program like Google Summer of Code, you want to have a profile that looks like the one at the bottom here at least. Okay, regular activity. I want to see that you're serious. I want to see that you do this regularly. I want to see that you know how to use Git properly, regularly, and competently. GitHub exports all of their metadata. They provide it for free for other people to write queries. So I can go in and I can put in your username to an existing query that I've written and analyze your contributions, whether you've only done five contributions or whether you've done 10,000. I can deduce, for example, which programming languages 
you actually use on a regular basis. And people do do this. They take that data and then they build web services on top of it. I'll just show you a few of them. This is one that does statistics for GitHub. On a daily basis, they crunch some numbers, look at all the repositories, look at all the users, look at all the lines of code, and try and assess uh, how fast GitHub is growing in various ways, either positive or negative against growth rates um, on certain um, indicators. But one that is more important is I was saying that I can write some queries to determine what programming languages you are good at. But there's also someone who has built a web service that provides this information. So here we have, uh, based on one algorithm, the top six programmers in Indonesia in the Java language, based on their actual contributions, on their real code, completely neutral. This is just the numbers, big data, crunching the data. If you notice the name down the bottom here, this is a gentleman that is in Malang, and we use these slides in Malang. And if we drill down in this website to Malang, he is the first, highest, uh, ranked uh, Java program in Malang. Uh, as I recall, he was 23, uh, still at university, and, and he's in Kuwait at the moment on a short-term uh, trip to, uh, to work, um, a short pause in his university career. Uh, and even though he's already international, going to Kuwait to do some uh, project work, the, the night that we're in Malang, uh, after the seminar, he joined Basuk Code. This is what his uh, profile looks like on uh, GitHub Awards. Here we see his Java ranking per city, country, and in the world. Uh, his C ranking, C++ ranking, uh, and here we have a language that uh, most of you will not have seen. Um, and I'll make sure I get the spelling right. Kot Kotlin, I think it is. Um, I, I had to Google that one. Uh, it's a Java derivative uh, that's just growing, um, but he's obviously very good at that. Swift and Ruby for some of the newer languages here as well that he's quite good at. So this is a very quick overview. One web page shows pretty much everything about this particular gentleman and about you and about me. It says what I'm actually doing now. Not what I say that I know, but what I actually do. So for example, my profile does not include a lot of SQL. However, I've had a long career involving a lot of SQL. But at the moment, since I've been using GitHub, I've not done very much in the way of SQL. So it's not visible. I'm not doing it at the moment. It's not, it's not able to be seen, so people can't, they don't have the evidence that I actually can do it. Now, I mentioned before that you should be using GitHub on a regular basis, but maybe you're not confident or you don't want to push your code up. There's a lot of projects that are not just code. As we were talking before about the psychology gentleman in Samarinda, he is doing it, it's mostly about data for him and a small amount of code to do the analysis. But it may not be anything to do with computers <coughs> or very little. This is a project to transcribe music. It's got a file format that people are uh, using to describe the notes, the sounds that people are making. Okay, so this is something that's very unrelated to computer science at least, um, and people are sharing it on GitHub. So you can have activity like this. Geospatial data, very, very important. There are many types of geospatial data about Indonesia that are still missing you cannot easily download and say, I just want a geo shape of, for example, all of the islands of Indonesia or all of the islands of Indonesia that have a population above, you know, a thousand people would be a fairly commonly desired uh, geo shape file. However, that's really hard to find. It's very easy to find one with the top 100 islands, maybe the top 200 islands, once you start getting further away from that, 
very hard to find. So there's something you could do on GitHub is create a, ge a GeoShape file of Indonesian data, um, mapping that data, making that available so other people can reuse it. GitHub is also used for websites and they will host it for free. So if anyone in this room is paying for web hosting, you might want to pay attention. Um, you don't need to pay. Provided you put your website code uh, into GitHub, they will host it for free. Okay, so this is the US federal source code policy by the US government. Fairly standard sort of website. All of the code is in GitHub in a single repository. As a result of this, they get the benefit of free hosting. While the US does have money problems, I'm sure they're not doing it for the money reasons. If they needed to buy web hosting, they could. But some of the benefits are the information that it provides. Like for example, here we have the language, languages that this repository is built in. GitHub tells you this. It also gives you a breakdown of who all the contributors are to your website, the actual code behind it. Here we have the two main contributors in the green here, some medium level contributors, and this page scrolls on and scrolls on with lots of smaller contributors. For example, this contributor here from Finland made a very small change to one of the pages, just declaring that this page is actually in English. It also has a bug tracker or an issue tracker, a project management capability that's linked to the repository and the source code. Very common feature of uh, software development is you have bugs and you need to fix them, you need to discuss them. Uh, that's part of GitHub. But here it's a website. We have a broader range of project management tasks being raised here. From discussions about the actual content of the website. There's a more open debate around how the policy should, um, should be written. Uh, where there should be policy changes and how they would be done. Down to thank you. Someone just saying thank you. Wow, you've put your policy online uh, able to be read by anyone. Okay, that can also be done. If you're writing at all, uh, there are tools that sit on top of GitHub that allow you to write essentially a book or at least a book structure um, and then host it and it looks like this when you browse it. It's a very nice sort of professional book layout. It's not a website. It doesn't have bells and whistles and all sorts of wonderful features and blinking text. It's a book with chapters, it's got sections, it's got paragraphs, it's got words in it. Got sentences and then words. Okay, standard layout. It's for someone who wants to write. They don't want to make decisions along the way. They don't want to be thinking about how it's going to be looking um, and you know, what colours it should be in, they just want to write a book. This tool allows you to do that, just standard plain writing with one little feature. Here is that book down in a GitHub repository. Okay, it just pushes all of that down into what's called the markdown format. Okay, the one little feature in uh, Git books is latex support. Now as the professors in the room will know, if you're submitting an academic paper to uh, a technical or um, scientific journal, you'll typically be required to submit it with latex formulas um, and using latex as the, the general format, as opposed to using Microsoft Word documents. So this is a way you can practice your latex. It's a very simple um, language for describing formulas um, that you all should become familiar with. There are also tools that let you build a Jekyll, a GitHub website, with a WYSIWYG. So if you don't like Markdown or restructured text or any of the um, formatting uh, languages, uh, here is a WYSIWYG that you can use where you've just got standard tools so someone like Cisco could easily build a website using this. 
And there's a tip in this. If you think you're going to build a career out of building websites, I suggest you have a look at SiteLeaf and realize that someone like Cisco will be building her own website. You're going to have to be a very good website builder for people to want to, want to pay you to build a website. Okay, you're going to have to be very good at the graphics, very good at the layout. It's going to have to be perfect because most people can do it themselves now. And in 10 years' time, everyone will be doing it themselves. There won't be a need for website creators. That's, that's not a job. That job doesn't exist now. Okay? And in 10 years' time, it will definitely not exist. Okay, in addition to GitHub, GitHub is also an integration point for many, many other services. And I'm only going to look at a few of them. The two main sets that you should become familiar with to be involved in IT in the future is continuous integration, which is taking a set of source code or a set of information of any sort really and checking that it still is correct. In a world where everybody is sharing information and merging information, you're going to receive changes from somebody else. So you've written a beautiful application, works well, someone says, I want to add a feature. They just add it and then they send you the code. So you've got this new code coming in and you get the opportunity to say yes or no to that code. Continu continuous integration is how you lower your uh, threshold of being scared. If the rules that you put in place, the continuous integration tests that you write, all are green when you accept the new code, then your software is still high quality. So for every change that you're reviewing, these tests are run, and if the tests pass, you can accept the code. If the tests fail, the code should be rejected. This is automatic checking. So instead of having people manually review code to begin with, we have tools essentially automatically checking for all of the basic problems, including style. So then when someone is actually, a person is reviewing the code, the style issues are already sorted out, the fact that it compiles, runs, and the tests work, all being automatically done. It's then the reviewers job to look into the future and try and guide the person to writing the best solution for that particular problem or merely accepting the code. If you know that all of your unit tests work, you might say that code is good enough, I can accept it without thinking about it. So the code reviewer is increasingly not reviewing code but writing continuous integration tests. So when I have a person uh, create code that doesn't work, instead of me having to tell them every time they submit code, I can write a rule once and then they'll automatically be told. And everyone else who ever submits code to me will be told the same thing. So I don't have to tell people the same thing every time. A computer will tell them. And while someone might say, oh, but I like the code this way, and they'll have a fight with me about how the code should look, if I've told the computer to tell them that the code shouldn't look that way, they don't fight with the computer. So it's a way of standardizing things and remo removing disputes. The most important continuous integration service is Travis CI. Okay, if we go back, it is this one at the top here. It provides Unix and OSX um, virtual machines for you to do whatever you like with for one hour. And at the moment, they are currently averaging around 1,000 virtual machines that they provide for free for you to use 
for open source code. 1,000 virtual machines for free. Another set of services are more specific. Instead of providing a virtual machine that does whatever you tell it to do, they are pre-built pieces of continuous integration that wrap up a particular type of check and automate the response back to the contributor. So for example, we have Code Climate, and down the bottom here, another one I'll look at very quickly is Bliss AI. If you have a Git repository with some content, you can ask these tools to automatically check that repository, check the code, and give you a report on how good it is. So if you've got some code that you think is high quality, you can add it to GitHub, turn on one of these tools, and get an email back 15 minutes later at worst, pointing out all of the issues of where your code might be improved. So this is Code Climate, looking at a few repositories and giving each of them a score. These are some Wikimedia repositories and, and some other ones down the bottom here. Okay, so here we have one that's very, very low quality code, uh, ranging up to one that's quite high quality code here. Mostly green, only a very, very small amount of red there. If we drill in to one of these projects, we'll see it identifies which files are specifically um, red, are, are a problem, need to be improved, critical. And some lower uh, hanging fruit here. So the code climate mostly handles the dynamic languages. We can see the top languages here. They are all um, dynamic, they're not compiled languages. These are the actual tools that they use um, to automatically check them. And if you drill in again, if you click in, uh, you'll see the actual source code, the actual error that they're saying, and you can go one step further if I click in this direction, and it will explain the problem and usually how to fix it automatically. Bliss AI is the other one to sort of look at quickly. Uh, the big difference here, uh, this is the front page of um, Bliss AI for a project. Here we have some red. Um, if I go to the next slide, that one there. We can see we have the compiled languages in here. C, C++, C Sharp, etc. So between these two tools, Code Climate and Bliss AI, almost any code that you, you've written can be validated. You get an email back telling you all the things you could do to improve your code. Things that you haven't thought of. So I highly recommend that you do that. Um, the more code that you push onto GitHub, the more that someone like myself, whether we're looking for you as a job applicant or we're looking at you for a mentoring program, we want to see what you can already do. And if you do submit your code, into GitHub, it puts you already above 90% of the coders in the world. Because most people don't do this. I usually get applications from people who do not have GitHub accounts and give me a blank sheet. Starting to get into this process of pushing your code online, asking your friends to review your code, peer review, very important skills for you to have in your future career.